afternoon, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 18th, 2024. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Maryland Department of Health's Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to today's Rate Review Advisory Group meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options to listen to the webinar by computer and by phone. And if you look at the panel interface on your right labeled audio, you can click either computer or phone to switch to the best option. We will be recording the webinar and posting this session on YouTube and the DDA website. Today's PowerPoint has also been uploaded as an attachment and is available for you to download in the webinar panel box. Questions can be typed in the question or chat box and the team um, will review and respond during the open discussion session portion of the webinar. We respectfully ask that all questions be held until that time. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Marlena Hutchinson to begin today's meeting. Good afternoon, Marlena. Good afternoon. Thank you, Donna. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Our humblest apologies for the technical uh, difficulties we had at the beginning. Thank you so much for uh, your patience with us. Welcome. Um, and thank you again for joining us for today's uh, Rate Review Advisory Group meeting. This is our third meeting. We are really excited about the good discussions that we're going to have today. Next slide, slide, please. Today's agenda starts with the approval of the March meeting minutes, an update on the Employment First work group, followed by a review of the feedback received from the Acuity Feedback Forum. We'll then give a few minutes on the general, general ledger supplemental. Finally, we'll have an open discussion before closing. Um, I'll now turn it over to Jennifer. Next slide, please. Good Jennifer, afternoon. for the approval of minutes. Yep, good afternoon, everyone. Um, See, the REG members were sent an email with meeting minutes on April 11th. Um, as co-chair, I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Um, would another member like to second? This is Chris, I'll second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor of the motion to approve the minutes that were sent on April 11th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, then the, the minutes are approved. And with that, I will turn it over to Leslie for an employment services update. Hey Jennifer, it's Chris. Can I ask one quick question before we bounce into the presentation? Can we make sure that uh, there's instructions on how to uh, do the public comment session? I know we had a little bit of trouble with that last time. I just want to make sure if anybody does want to speak that they have the opportunity to do so. Sure, um, we can make sure there are clear instructions um, in the meeting announcements. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Donna, you can go ahead and advance the slide, please. All right, so just to remind everybody, um, wanted to kind of touch back, base back on the Employment First work group. So, um, just as to kind of ground all of us, and as a reminder, that's a, that, that has been a collaborative effort that has really existed to help increase competitive integrated employment for DDA participants. Um, at this juncture, we would like to reground ourselves to ensure that we are making the most efficient use of time and our resources, um, and to really make sure we're able to successfully meet the objectives of the group. Um, so what does that mean? 
So we're working on a draft charter for the group as a whole. Um, those of you who have been involved may remember we had subcommittees that each had a charter, um, but we wanna look at the group as a whole and, and draft a, a charter. Um, so we're making sure we're, everything is clearly defined. Um, we'll also be reviewing our membership to ensure that we have adequate cross-representation across all our stakeholder groups. Um, so that was a very short update. With that, I'll turn it back over to, I'll turn it over to Robert. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, just to kind of follow up on Leslie's announcement, uh, the Employment First group will need to finalize their policy review. Uh, this is kind of talking about process because there's been some confusion in the past related to the scope and the role of the Employment First work group. Um, anything that has that is rate related gets addressed through the RAG process so uh, their their role is more of you know to inform policy inform waiver changes etc then we evaluate it to see if uh, those changes have a rate impact and then we work it through the RAG process any questions before we move on. Robert, it's Chris, Chris just a quick question. Uh, is there value in continuing our conversation about employment? I know we want certainly want the, the feedback from the Employment First work group, but is it worth giving them our RAG concerns so when they're sitting down and looking at drafting policies that they have those considerations in the back of their head? Yeah, and so, Good point, Chris. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that we are no longer having dialogue, obviously, related to employment service services. So um, Leslie, who is part of this team, uh, part of the RAG, uh, uh, representing um, the DDA side of the house, you know, she obviously is privy to some of the discussions we've been having and are having and will be having. Um, and she can certainly kind of share some of uh, those challenges and or some of the things that we're, we're striving or, or trying to solve for. Um, also, um, as mentioned, it doesn't mean that we won't be addressing employment services or, or any other meaningful day rates, because as Marlena mentioned during the last cycle, we are going to use the general ledger uh, data that we collect, that data that is due by the end of September uh, to inform a, a rebase. And, and again, the caveat that, you know, obviously any rebase to, to rates doesn't necessarily mean any new funding that's a separate process. So um, we're going to continue to uh, keep employment on the radar screen. Okay, so during the March RAG meeting, DDA provided an overview of the current strategy and range of services tailored to meet the diverse levels of needs of individuals. The RAG and provider community was invited to provide specific guidance to assist with further exploring acuity within the current rate structure, specifically insights on where adjustments might be necessary and what kind of data providers could contribute to support these analyses uh, were solicited via survey. Um, could we uh, please advance to slide eight, please? <clears throat> Communication on the request for feedback in the survey link were sent to approximately 350 individuals uh, from many different provider agencies. Several email reminders were also sent to encourage providers to share insights and important information necessary to pursue acuity as a rate priority this year. Of the 350 people solicited, there were a total of 31 responses received to the acuity feedback survey. Of those responses, 21 respondents indicated they wanted to suggest an approach for an acuity adjustment. A careful review of those responses identified that 18 were directly related to acuity and some responses were focused on issues other than acuity. Next slide, please. 
The feedback from the 18 respondents who addressed acuity in their responses was reviewed and analyzed to identify themes across responses, and you can see those themes here. Um, <clears throat> these themes were then considered within the context of the current policies and services available. During the March RAG meeting, DDA provided information on how the person-centered planning process is used to identify participants, assess needs, level of services, and preferences. This process currently provides the opportunity for participants to discuss the supports and services available for individuals with different levels of need. Uh, for example, <clears throat> enhanced residential and support services, overnight supports and overnight supervision and dedicated supports, including two to one staff to participant supports. Additionally, enhanced rates are available when participants have a behavioral support plan or nursing care plan. The feedback received varied greatly, but some of the key themes across respondents included focus on how to identify those with higher needs, current DDA services and policies, um, DDA uses the following processes to identify individuals with higher needs, um, including person-centered planning tools, the health risk screening to tools, uh, or, or the HERST as we commonly refer to it, and other health and welfare assessments to determine the participants' assessed needs, level of services, and preferences. <clears throat> All residential, meaningful day, and respite services should also be considered. Um, current DDA services and policies, uh, the DDA operated Medicaid waiver programs include enhanced residential, meaningful day and support services, overnight supports and overnight supervision, dedicated supports including one-to-one -one and two-to-one, staff to participant supports and enhanced rates. Um, I would also like to add that new data elements for the GL should include providers reporting specific participant uh, information, uh, such as matrix scores, her scores, number of behavioral plans, and number of nursing plans. And so based on our current uh, services and policies, uh, we do have behavioral support plans and, and nursing care plans as part of that. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't receive the specific feedback we were seeking regarding the particular challenges that service providers are facing, which are not already effectively addressed through our existing DDA services and policies. Um, as such, it is difficult for us to proceed in targeting a specific rate or service without the necessary feedback from the providers. <clears throat> but having said that, you know, we want to uh, acknowledge that while we've had these definitions and rates in place now for about three years, we've not done a deep dive into training providers on how to access, access these services that meet the individual's needs. So to address this, we will be organizing a series of trainings, um, lunch and learn sessions, et cetera, with a more targeted, uh, with more targeted guidance related to acuity, how we, we solve for it, uh, using examples and um, helping providers navigate that. Uh, we also acknowledge that this system may not be suitable for a very small number of agencies. And for those agencies, we highly encourage you to collaborate with your regional office to resolve any issues related to acuity. Um, I'd now like to uh, turn it over to Karen Lee to share uh, a little bit about how her organization addresses acuity using our current service definitions. Karen? We're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes. Um, 
so first of all, I'd like to ask, are we, are we, we had talked at one time about changing our, our, our um, I guess we're using GoToWebinar about possibly changing the, um, the format in which we use it, because it's really difficult to raise your hand in this format. I don't think you can really do it, but anyway, just something I wanted to bring, bring back forward to see if there was a, another way for us to be able to um, work together on this. Um, I had a chance to talk to Robert the other day, and interestingly enough, the of the 350 people surveyed, and 18 of them had real concerns, that's about 5%. And when I went back and met with my team here at SEEK, what I found is we really have to get creative with about 5% of our plans. And so we have um, a number of people who have very complicated life situations. Um, a lot of them, most of them, or the majority of them, 95%, have the ability to use something in the rate system. And, and I know that as a member of the early adopter group that we had the benefit of um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one support and attention as we went through the process. And so we really did a tremendous deep dive. I do have a um, something to share. Can I share my screen, Robert, or is that? And I actually don't yes. even know how to share my screen on here. Yes, you can. Um, Donna, can you allow Karen to share her screen, please? I don't even know if I can do that. I don't know how to do it on this platform, unfortunately. Oh, here, maybe this is it. Okay, show screen. Is that sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. And it's a picture of a, with a circle in the middle of it. <laughs> I want to make sure you're seeing the right screen. Okay, thank you. So we developed this really early on when we were in the early adopters because we needed we knew that our frontline team needed to know what to negotiate and use, and we knew that the CCSs were not um, always clear about what services could be used to support people. And so we took every one of the services that we were licensed for, and it doesn't have things in there like the um, two-on-one or everything, but all of our services, so our theme is Live, Work, Thrive. So these are all of our work. Um, and then here's the funding mechanism, here's the Live, and then here is the Thrive. And so all of the services that we provide are on here in the units in which we use them so that it's a really great tool for our our frontline, um, our frontline team. So I wanted to just share a couple of the really kind of complicated things that we have. And again, I think it is probably about 5% of the people we work with that it's, you know, you're not gonna just pull a, a service off of the shelf and use that we have to do some complications. So, and I did of course change the names here, um, but uh, Barb and Andy live together and Barb needs constant support and supervision. She's got uh, very significant brittle bone syndrome and um, always needs two people to do any, anything with her or she could break a bone and has broken bones. And so um, we had to add on two for one for Barb in both CDS and in for supported living when hours when she's not getting in um when she's getting in and out of the chair and out of bed and needs help to eat and and everything else and so that's a little bit complicated it's it's not too much different than what we did in the past um this one is way more complicated this is um somebody we support gets and, and by the way this situation happens with about a more than a half dozen people that we support. Their residential services have him have people on two to one, so they have two staff supporting the one person, and they they're getting CDS from another organization, not from us, but they're getting their employment supports from us, and um, so they're getting two to one services all the time. But when we go into discovery with them. There's not, there's not only is there not two staff, there's, 
there's one staff that is really looking at the employer and talking to the employer and so on. And so we have figured out a way with them where the CDS provider either sends somebody, in some cases, they send the two people with the person, um, or they have had to reduce the number of um, uh, hours a week that they provide CDS, and then we have to hire staff. And it's really complicated for us because when we're hiring the second staff and the other two staff, we don't need them all the time. And we truly believe in this situation that once the once these people start their jobs, they're going to be able to go down to the one on one, which is covered by ongoing support. Um, and we won't need to have that two on one anymore. We think that the job is really the answer for for how they can live more independently. Uh, but there was a lot of negotiation and some of the providers um, that we work with who who have situations like this, they aren't willing to give up those CDS hours. And so bringing in the CCS to really negotiate that for people has been important and, and really quite difficult. And, and also with the regional office, having them having them involved. So this is an example where it really, the off the shelf services really don't work for people. Um, this is probably a situation that comes up in lots of organizations. And we have a number of people who get this kind of service. Um, so I just used Alice as an example. She lives with the roommate. This is also a very odd situation. I think we might even be one of the only people in the state who do this. Um, she lives with somebody who's self-directed. So she gets, Alice gets her services through us and her roommate gets self-directed services. But because Alice gets services through us and the other person does not, it's considered a supported living one person because the other person is not getting the same DDA service. Um, and she has dementia related to her Down syndrome. And, um, but she had a really great life and she's got stuff that she does all day long and um, the family and she really did not want, um, when her needs became more intense, they did not want for her to be separated from the friends that she worked with and had been spending her days with. And so um, what we did instead is we added a one-on-one -on -one and we went, instead of using the CDS one-on-three, um, in, instead of doing that, we ended up having to um, do the one-on-one. -on -one, um, and then the other folks that she's with, they get the one-on-four, the CDS, um, and then her friends, they can hang out together. So they have the, the, the staffing together. This one also took a little bit of, of work because we had to demonstrate that that she actually needed to get that um, additional support because she hadn't been having it for so long. So we needed to get some nursing in, information and so on uh, and really work with, uh, with, the, um, with the regional office and with the CCS. So those are just some of the examples of ways that we have had to um, be really creative about how we use the LTSS system to fund these supports. And, and um, you know, I think, again, as I said to you, I felt like um, probably the system works for 95% of the people, which is a really big, huge win, I think, is, but the flexibility of providers of being able to negotiate. And, and the other issue, of course, is that we want to make sure that the CCSs know about all of the options, about the adding in the intensive supports, about adding in additional people to provide supports when needed and, and how to be creative um, with overnight supports and all of that. And, and that's been a learning experience for everybody, I think, is, is how to use that system that way. But again, you know, I'm a benefit to us that we were early adopters and got to ask, um, ask these questions and try to solve these issues. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Karen. Um, next slide, please. Hey, Robert, it's Chris. Quick question before you, you jump. Karen, thank you for your, your thoughts there. I, I think uh, you're really kind of nailing the braiding of services component. Um, Robert, if we're going to do a presentation or somebody's going to present in the work group, can we, and I know the short time frame on this one, but can we make sure we get those materials in advance? Karen had a lot of information there. 
and going pretty quick is really hard to, to kind of follow along. I'll, um, I'll send them if you want, Chris. Yeah, please. Certainly, you know, certainly would, would like to take a look at it. And I, I think the approach to braiding services and, and ensuring that we've got as much support as we can for the individual, the correct support for the individual. I, I still think that we're missing the the differential piece. And Karen, I think you said it, it's 5% of the people. I, I think based on the, the numbers that I've run and comparing uh, the old rate system to the new rate system, and I know it's taboo to talk about that, that there's a, a the significant group of people at the higher end of the old matrix system, the more complex individuals where the, the base rate is less. And I know we're doing the add-on component, the dedicated hours to, to get the additional supports to make that piece work. But adding hours does not address the additional expenditures are tied to that individual. Um, you know, if I add 10 hours of support to somebody, it does not adjust the compensation factor or the calculation for Example, say for somebody's workers' compensation insurance, you know, providers that serve behavior or medically complex people, that rate tends to be higher. Uh, we have a factor right now of, of a percentage of, of, you know, work comp in uh, attached to the wages. Again, as we pay out more wages, providers pay more work comp. It does not compensate for uh, a provider who has uh, more claims because of the type of individuals we serve. So. I think it may be kind of maybe a piece of it. I don't think it addresses all the differential. And then I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at this. We've got residential enhanced. I don't know why we can't come up with enhanced services for the other ones that would give us the additional resources uh, to do that piece. I, I just I think that there's a, a mechanism that's there, that it's in place uh, for a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I'd like to see it really think it, it should come across to the rest of the services. I, I don't know how you can have an enhanced need in residential. I mean, you could be an individual, but not you haven't any availability for that level of service uh, within day supports. I would like to piggyback on what you just said, Chris, as well, because I think the other thing that needs to be considered is there are a number of providers out there that they support over 5% of the people they support that fall into that category. And that's another, you know, challenge when you support multiple people in day services or uh, employment where you, you don't have the availability of that. It is, it's very trying um, financially. Um, we've heard from a number of providers um, that does affect them when the majority of their people or you know, 30%, 40% of the people they're supporting have those significant needs and challenges. Um, you mentioned the workers' comp. I mean, there are definitely, definitely stories out there where how those rates have really gone up due to that population of people that are being supported. And then just real quick on the stacking piece, uh, we're still struggling, having great challenges with the stacking because that was definitely put in place to allow flexibility we were all on board with that. We really saw how that stacking truly, truly supported person-centered planning. And um, we're still hitting roadblocks with that. Um, so I'm not really sure where we are with agencies being able to continue stacking services. Um, some are getting kickbacks, can't do it. Others are still being able to do it. Um, but I think that's something that needs to be discussed with that as well. Can, can I ask you a question, Donna? I, I, I think people are, the term stacking has become used in a way. Do you mean getting people um, uh, over authorized just in case you might use one or the other? Or do you mean actually like employment on top of, 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 um, CDS or or they have in CDS or do you mean like we get an over authorization and then and then you know so that we have whatever it is that their day looks like you get the over authorization so that the person can really be supported the best way to support them during that time so the idea was so you wouldn't have to keep going back and having addendums to planning meetings so for example, I have somebody who's employed and I have somebody who has day program or CDS or day program supports, let's say. And so her work schedule varies from week to week because she's in retail. There are no set schedules. 
Sometimes it's 20 hours a week, sometimes it's 10. And what she's now decided is on the day she doesn't go to work, she doesn't always want to come to the day program or do CDS, she just wants to go home. She's 59 years old. Well, we're not being approved to add additional residential hours for her to go home because we're told we have hours in for day program. Well, we do, but she doesn't want to come here. So it's things like that that we're running yeah. into. So, so I, I, I think we have to be really careful because the, the terminology is a Medicaid terminology, sequencing, grading, and, and what we're talking about is something different than stacking of services. We're talking about loading, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying one way or another is right, but it's really you're getting an over authorization so that you have flexibility. That's different than what the terminology Medicaid uses when they're talking about braiding, blending, and stacking services. They're, they're, we're, in Maryland, all of a sudden, about four months ago, we started to misuse the term stacking, but it's, it's, the, it's what we were told to do, absolutely, that to give us flexibility, we get over-authorized, but we only use what it is that we've, we've got to use for people. Well, and there's a cap on what you can bill for. Right. So you're not going to you're not going to get paid 60 hours a week. There's a max right. on what you can bill for, but that flexibility of receiving multiple services during that week is what does get diminished. Is it Donna, is it at the CCS level you're not getting it through or is it at the regional office level? Well, Karen, I think this is probably a whole another discussion because it's in terms of how the instructions were put out at the beginning. Um, from DDA to providers so that it could allow for flexibility. And now there's all different stories. I mean, it's not just the one example I gave, there are other providers that have lots of examples. So I don't know that this is a particular discussion right this moment for this group. I'm just, you know, putting that into the mix of when we're talking about acuity. And, and Karen, and uh, to Donna's point, the concerns that she's raising in regard to approvals and so forth, we are hearing about them and we're following up accordingly. I don't want to conflate the topics here and I definitely want us to stick to the agenda. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and thanks for your, your input. Thanks again, Karen. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, Donna. Um, so to Robert, try to keep, keep us on task. Can I just ask one last question before we go? And, and, and I think it's a, it's a key point from a data collection perspective, as you've heard me say over the years, data collection, strategic data collection plan. 350 solicitations go out, 31 come back. That's a problem. So I guess, do we need to stop and take a look at our communication system, communication style? How do we, and I don't think it's anybody's fault, I think it's just, it's, our, it's our, well, where we are. How do we get better? Because that responsibility solely can't be on Max, it can't be on the RAG, it can't be, it, it can't solely be on DDA. We're all in it together. How do we get from 10% to 90%? How do we let the providers know that that the importance of this, the urgency of it? I mean, you know, we can we can say it all we blue till we're blue in the face, but I think until DDA says it, you know, to, they'll listen to us. They'll have to do what you tell them to do. How do we get the providers to work, to understand, to comply, and to get the data that we need? Because if this pattern continues going forward, everything that we touch is going to be a struggle. So those are some of the conversations that we've been having, Chris. As you know, we do have some data, like, for example, the general data collection tool where um, completion is mandatory for 100% of providers. So uh, we continue to have those conversations. Um, but for some of these things, we're, when we're doing these supplements or we're trying to address issues that you all have brought to the table, um, the providers, they have skin in the game. And if they want to see changes, and this is not something new that's been said here, the secretary has said it many times, then they're going to have to do what they need to do in order to inform decisions. We have our process is a data driven process, period. Um, the Rob, one Rob, thing I want to go ahead, Greg. Yeah, just you know, as I as I'm hearing that, you know, it's that uh, you know, it's the same old 
communication challenge that all of us have in every area of our business where <clears throat> you send stuff out and 10% of the people respond and the other 90% complain that there's bad communication, right? So I would just, I would suggest that maybe, maybe this is just something to consider rather than doing a blanket approach, pick, pick, pick 15 providers that work incredibly effectively with DDA and survey them and get 100% of those 15 instead of getting 10% of 150 that are being blanketed. And that's, you know, you would of course want to look at making sure you had the right, um, you know, the, the right uh, scope of services represented in whatever that, whatever that group is. And this may be a crazy, stupid idea. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just saying that if there's folks that you could trust that you say, when I need something for you, you're going to get it. It might be an easier way to get a, a more, uh, more accurate, more efficient uh, data than trying to, you know, turn the Titanic around here. Um, so it's just a thought. Thank you. We'll take that under advisement. Um, before Robert, can I just, I'm sorry, can I just say one thing on this topic? I know you're trying to move on, but I just wanted to say, you know, we did hear from a lot of providers. Um, and I think one of the issues, one of the reasons that you had the response that you had, which I don't think was a terrible response, um, personally, is that it, they were very complex technical questions that were being asked. And I think that providers can tell you what they are experiencing. They can talk about the people they support. They can talk about the financial situations they're experiencing, the challenges they're having with waivers or you know uh, implementation um, and their basic finances. Um, but to ask how to approach addressing acuity are, are really, to me, questions more for actuaries, actuarial staff, maybe some providers who have been involved in rate setting who um, really have had the opportunity to spend more time focused on it. But I think that it, I personally don't think anybody should take that response to mean that there aren't people who feel there's an issue. I heard from many providers that they felt there was an issue, but um, they really didn't know how to answer the, com the complexity of those questions. That's um, helpful feedback, Laura. And I'm not certain if the providers you heard from actually participated in the survey or not, but we do have technical assistance available to providers. And so as you're hearing those kinds of concerns, would you please forward them to us so that we can work with those providers directly because we do offer technical assistance. Again, we really need this to be a data-driven approach and we want as much representation as possible. Um, we're certainly amenable to any recommendations to get a broader or more participants involved in this process. So these are very helpful comments. Um, if you are hearing that individuals are having issues with answering the questions, please um, just send them over to us because we'll work with them. We are offering technical assistance. I appreciate that. And we've certainly sent people, uh, we actually um, sent some questions that we received about the GLS productivity tool, um, sent some questions to Hilltop. I know the Hilltop staffers have been very helpful to providers who've reached out to them. I think this set of questions, to me, fell into a little bit of a different category, but you know, we certainly always um, will send folks over for the resources that are there. Thank you so much, Laura. And if anyone else has um, suggestions in regard to, as we continue to cast the net to get more participation, if you have any other suggestions, we're certainly open to them. Yeah, thank you. Um, and again, before we uh, wrap up <clears throat> Acuity, um, again, we have identified ways that providers can uh, appropriately provide services for higher Acuity people while still receiving reasonable and accurate reimbursement. Uh, and and we're, again, we're happy to assist providers with learning the appropriate tools to handle high Acuity members 
and highly encourage providers who may find this a, a challenge to reach out to their regional offices who um, are standing by to assist. So uh, based on the re review of provider responses and feedback and consideration of current policies and services available in acuity analysis, uh, we, uh, an acuity analysis will not be pursued for the FY26 rate cycle, but as I mentioned, we will be working to coordinate and schedule a series of acuity lunch and learn sessions to assist providers, as well as CCS agencies. We don't want to forget about the role that they play um, in this uh, with using the current assessment tools and PCP process to ensure participants assess needs, uh, level of services and preferences are incorporated into their plan of care. Sessions will highlight current strategies and range of services available. Providers and CCS agencies will have opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning as well as learn and share specific examples and strategy. And so that obviously will happen outside of the RRAG process. Um, once we have the dates identified and the times, we will be sending that out via constant contacts uh, to everyone. And, and we really look forward to those sessions and addressing, um, helping uh, providers navigate um, that issue. So, um, Robert, can I ask you a quick question about the lunch and learns? The the strategies and range of services. I'm, I'm assuming we're going back to what Karen was talking about with the braiding and over authorization piece. Is that correct? Yeah. It, well, the, the the purpose is to make sure that providers truly understand the service definitions, how we account for acuity, um, learn, um, encourage them to bring examples so that we can even walk through some of the examples. Um, and yes, it will touch on how um, Karen and, and and Seek is addressing acuity through some of the the braiding and blending of services as well. Would would there be value in using those sessions to gather input from the providers on their thoughts on acuity. I mean, I think a lot of them are already attempting to do the, the braiding and the over authorization. And certainly that can't hurt anybody, but I don't think that that directly addresses acuity. And I think if you have the groups together, if, if we're able to get them in one place and get feedback from them, I'd be curious to see their feedback on acuity and what their thoughts are and what their pinch points are. Um, you know, again, I, I think the braiding and the over authorization is a piece of, but I don't think that that really addresses acuity in my opinion. Absolutely, Chris. Um, we're definitely going to be leveraging those platforms as opportunities to get feedback. Again, they're lunch and learns. So as we're mm -hmm. getting feedback and we're hearing from the provider community, we'll definitely um, use that platform to address the very things that you, you mentioned. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank Robert, you. can I um, make another suggestion? I don't know if the intent is to hold the lunch and learns with the providers and the CCS agencies together, because normally when sessions and trainings are done, they're separate. But I really think in this case, especially since we're not addressing the acuity for 26, it would be very uh, effective in terms of moving together for services for the people we support if the providers and the CCSs were at the same meetings together and hearing the message the same way um, and giving the examples. And then my other um, question was, do you know who's gonna lead the lunch and learns and when they're projected to start? Yeah, so more information will be forthcoming, Donna. Uh, again, it will happen outside of this process. So. Um, we have already started to, to, to work on that, so hopefully um, within the next few weeks, information will be pushed out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Robert, to follow up to, to Donna's point with the CCS and the providers being together, if the regional office fiscal staff that are approving the plans and the authorizations, if they could also participate in that too, I think that's a win-win-win. Thank you. We're going to switch gears um, and we're going to talk about the general ledger supplemental updates. Um, but before I turn it over to, to Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to, to Marlene just to say a few things. 
Just want to um, circle back on a comment from the last meeting in regard to the GLS data collection effort. Um, we, the GL template is our data collection strategy now and moving forward. And so, as we mentioned, this tool is intended to be the data collection tool that provider, providers are required to complete and submit from here on out. Um, we do agree and we acknowledge that the tool is a work in progress as, as the case with um, all tools, but it's gonna take time for some providers to become accustomed to using it um, for, our, for us to get accurate data submitted to us and we are satisfied that the tool is collecting the data we need in the format that we need to really inform a data-driven process. So again, if you're hearing that individuals are having challenges with completing the tool, we really, really encourage you to send them our way because we are providing technical assistance um, to providers. Next slide, please. Can you please jump to slide number 12 and um, Kristen? Thanks, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Kristen at Hilltop. And just want to talk through a little bit of the um, progress and where we are with the GLS template to collect the data for the productivity factor analysis. Um, as we talked a little bit before about Acuity, we wanted to just share um, some of the details on the providers who did submit feedback. As you'll recall, we talked about the template during our last RAG meeting, and it was shared with the entire provider network. Um, and so this equated to over 1,000 emails that went out to approximately 350 provider organizations. Um, and so we focused the feedback that we're sharing today to those um, day hub providers um, who will be required to submit the data and the feedback that we received. Um, and so just a quick reminder there was you know three different communications sent out to providers reminding them to review the template and send us feedback um, and so you can see we received feedback from almost 20 percent of the they have providers um, which was wonderful um, so we had lots of feedback about questions um, instructions data points some clarifications and this feedback was really helpful um, to the team to review and to kind of discuss and make edit to the final template that was shared for data collection. Um, we had lots of clarification questions on a variety of topics, including um, DSP levels, allocation methods, accounting codes, um, and day habilitation services themselves. There's a lot of providers curious about what services we were collecting data for and who was and was not required. Um, we actually did get a few templates submitted back to us as part of this feedback process. Um, so our team did take the opportunity to review those templates and provide those providers with feedback um, and ask them to submit on the updated version of the template. Um, and then we've also done some follow-up with those providers just to ensure they didn't have any questions um, based on the feedback that we shared. Um, we did get some requests for exemptions um, from providers, um, as well as you know, those providers inquiring whether they were required to submit the template or not. Next slide, please. So following all that feedback that we received, um, we did finalize the template and share it with providers. Um, so it was posted to the DDA website and email communications were shared on March 19th. Um, so we are underway with data collection. Um, providers were given the opportunity to sign up and attend two technical assistance training sessions um, to review the template, the instructions, and to walk through an example template. Um, to help us track the representativeness of the data received, we have reviewed all claims for dehabilitation services provided between July and December of 2023, so those target um, fiscal 24 quarters that we're collecting the data, um, so that as we receive our your submissions back, we're kind of able to identify the number of participants served by the provider organizations, as well as the reimbursements, so we can sort of track the percentage of people um, and services that we're capturing based on the submissions back to us. And so to give a quick update on the submissions um, that we've received, um, as of today, we have received uh, templates from three providers um, with the required data. Um, and if we're looking at the representativeness of those templates, um, 
that is about 2.7% of the DAHAB providers um, who provided service during, during that period, um, and about 2.5% of the expenditures and 2% of the participants served. Um, and so we are encouraged by the submissions that we've received, as well as the communications that we're getting from providers, lots of questions, um, providers reaching out to get lots of clarifications on where costs should be um, placed within the template. Um, we've taken the opportunity to reach out to those providers who have submitted um, with clarification questions um, to help make sure that we've got the data as clean as possible. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, give a little more um, detail on the technical assistance that's been provided. Um, we did have the two sessions um, that were very well attended. We had a total unduplicated count of 156 individuals um, who logged in and listened. Um, and there was lots of questions um, during the sessions. Um, we did a walkthrough of all the materials and then allowed enough ample time for providers to, to ask questions and clarifications. Um, so kind of some key themes for the Q&A sessions during those sessions. Um, we had lots of confirmation on what providers were required to submit the data. Um, again, so we're trying to be really clear that we're collecting data from all the dehabilitation providers um, and what those services are. And then we had many questions about DSP staff and wage information. Um, so there are several questions on the provider information tab. And so we reviewed those data points and provided clarification um, on how the data should be entered and what we're expecting. We had questions and clarifications on specific items and cost categories. Um, so lots of specific examples um, that providers asked exactly where they should be um, placing those costs. Um, so we talked through that. And then we also had um, several questions about how providers um, who did not feel they had any non-billable time or providers who felt that they could not separate out that non-billable time and how that should be added in the template when submitted back. And so we talked through um, the different ways that that can be documented in the template um, and the notes that can be provided um, when they're submitted um, to help with that issue. Um, and to, add, add, to date, um, or if we go to the next slide and talk a little bit about when we pulled the data um, to share with you, as of last week, so as of um, the 10th, we had received 14 emails from 12 unique providers um, with questions or requesting clarification on um, technical assistance um, related to the template. And so you can see kind of a breakdown of the types of requests that we're getting and, and responses that we're providing. I will say um, that we have continued to receive um, lots of emails, you know, even beyond what we pulled um, to create the deck last week. Um, so I, as of this morning, we've communicated with over 19 providers. Um, we're having one-on-one -on -one phone calls to review templates, you know, answering questions, um, lots of responses back in email to specific, you know, again, clarifications and how data should be entered into the template. Um, so just another reminder, as Marlene keeps saying, like we're available for technical assistance. We're happy to schedule phone calls, you know, review documents, anything that we can do to support um, a better understanding. I will say providers have been um, very thankful of the sessions um, and also have said that they are using it as an opportunity to make sure that they're allocating the cost correctly um, for the larger general ledger template submission that will be due later in September. Um, so please reach out if you have questions. Um, next slide, please. This is a slide that we created as part of our technical assistance um, sessions, but I thought it'd be really helpful to put it here for all providers. It's really your um, one slide for all the resources. So our email address, if you have questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. There's a link to the recorded sessions, and there's also a link to the Qualtrics um, submission. And so this is how we're accepting and receiving all of the general ledger supplemental um, templates. And then just our big reminder that all the templates are due by May 1st um, in about two weeks. Hey, Chris, it's Chris. Just a quick question for you. The point about how to report no non-billable time, how many providers were struggling with the, the concept of separating it versus how many felt that they didn't have any non-billable time? Because I'm struggling with the, 
concept of not having any non-billable time? Um, so we probably heard from a handful of providers and I would say it was about 50-50. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Kristen, can I ask a, a question about the non-billable time? Do you have a sense of whether people felt they had non-billable time in LTSS versus PCIS2? I, I sort of, you know, I'm probably feeling the same way that Chris is. So I, I, I understand it more, much more in PCIS2, the way those payments are made versus LTSS. I will say that we haven't dug into those details. Um, I think it, we will be able to glean a little more once we start getting submissions um, as providers send that data back. Um, we also are able to see where the providers are billing in terms of whether it's in LTSS Maryland um, or in PCIS2. So I think we'll have a better sense of the um, that an answer to that question once we see more of the data. Yeah, to me, I, I mean, if I was looking at that data, I would. If somebody was billing solely in LTSS and said they had no non-billable time, that you know, that would sort of be a, a red flag for me. Just for what it's worth. Yep, no, thanks for that. We agree. Great. Um any other questions before we move on to open discussion? Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, we definitely wanna thank you all for your thoughtful comments um, that you've made during the presentation, um, but we still wanna take a few minutes to uh, allow for open discussion from the RAG, and then we'll move on to public comments. Robert, I, I have a question about, um, in the beginning we started talking about employment, and I understand that Leslie's talking about retooling the Employment First Committee, and that is um, a separate issue from the um, RAG. I I'm just, again, asking for the second year in a row every single time we meet when are we going to be able to have a discussion about um employment rates and the and the really the productivity issue in the employment rates is really i think the primary issue um and i know that you're doing that around the um they have with a with the survey that was done and we have something coming in september but waiting another year before we address the rate for employment is just seems after it's been the top thing that people have asked to discuss for the last two years and we just continually put it off. Thank you, Karen. So um, as you know, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, we're going to be doing a rebase um, based on the data that we get from the general ledger tool that will help to um, at least get a sense of what components with em employment services need to be adjusted, et cetera. Um, we know that there's urgency um, to look at an employment services rates hence the retooling of the Employment First work group and being able to um, leverage the, uh, the NEON grant that was received. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we hear you. Hey, Robert, it's Chris. Just to kind of follow up to, to Karen's point, uh, the note that I had down here, you know, with employment and, and for me with acuity, what do those discussions look like for our RAG for the rest of the year? I mean, we made the commitment that we've got these three agenda items for the year that we're not going to, uh, you know, we're not going to bring any other ones into the to the fray. Uh, so, you know, I kind of agree with Karen on that one. How do we, can we continue that? I mean, if we're looking at employment rates, can we look at a data collection tool? Because, you know, next year you're going to, you're going to want data. So I, I think we can start to address the, the root pieces of it now and be prepared more to discuss next year when the Employment First uh, Worker is back up and running 
I think we put ourselves in a better position rather than waiting for them to get running and then discuss. Uh, so I guess my question is, is if employment and acuity and the productivity can still be discussion points for this year, even if we're not going to rebase them this year, still need to be discussions that need to move forward. And, and we made that commitment. But if not, then what can we bring into the fold to start to address moving forward? Because there's, you know, six or seven or eight more priorities beyond uh, the three that we, we had identified as priorities for this year. Yes, Chris. So we, we did say that we would continue the discourse around employment services um, during our RAG. We're not going to um, shut down that conversation. And, and to your point, it will help us get some things teed up for, for the next cycle and, and start thinking about what kind of data we would need that's specific to employment services, but also um, allow Leslie to share some of the information um, related to some of the concerns that come from this group with the Employment First work group so that they're uh, making recommendations from a policy and or uh, regs or waiver perspective. Is it fair then to have that as an agenda item for the next meeting to, to discuss at least a, a plan for what we need to do with employment and acuity moving forward? for the rest of this this uh, cycle. That's something that we'll certainly discuss offline. Thank you, sir. I wasn't aware that the NEON, uh, the NEON SME was helping with rates around employment. No, no Is, they're not helping. Are they looking at our rates? No, they're not helping with rates karen they're going to help us uh you know based on the recommendations recommendations that come out of employment uh work we'll do that crosswalk work um from from recommendation to policy to waiver so it has nothing to do with rates Okay, um, Donna, do we have any public comments? Um, we do have a few questions. We can't hear you, Donna. Can you all hear us? Yes. Do we um, have any um, questions from the public? Yes. Uh, well, actually, we have comments and questions. Um, just a comment on flexibility of services with stacking and braiding. Uh, the idea behind flexibility is wonderful. However, if we are trying to expand the hours for a service, in someone's plan, we are not able to make those adjustments within 90 days at an annual meeting. So I do see some comments um, uh, from an individual in the public who want, wants to reach out. So uh, we'll certainly uh, reach out uh, to you um, to, to, to listen to some of your inputs. Okay. Um, there's a question related to other workshops for new providers. Do we offer any additional workshops for providers? Um, Leslie, do you want to take that question? Sure, thanks, Robert. Um, at this time, we don't offer formalized workshops, but our regional offices are, are there to provide any technical assistance that you may need. Specifically, um, the provider services team. Okay. 
And then there's another question related to the training schedule. Again, we will uh, be sending out more information on the training related to acuity and our service definitions and the different tools, et cetera, that we have to, that, that addresses that. Um, that will be forthcoming within the next few weeks. And there are some comments that are not related to RAG or to the this process um, that we will forward along to the respective party uh, for follow-up. And um, Donna, there's a request someone would like to speak. Can that person raise their hand? Is it Michael? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Michael Greenberg. I'm a physician and I'm a parent of a young man with autism who requires pretty intensive behavioral supports. Uh, I'm a former commissioner for the Commission for People with Disabilities, and I currently chair the newly created Montgomery County Commission on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Um, I appreciate the ability to give input today as a parent, which is how I'm speaking, uh, about the importance of including acuity in the rate system. Um, I, I also serve as director of a grassroots kind of advocacy group that's been around for years, Special Needs Advocacy Coalition, which works on a volunteer basis with hundreds of families throughout Maryland. Um, I understand the importance of the work that all of you are doing, and it's good to impact greatly the lives of thousands of uh, individuals in Maryland with DD. Based on years of discussion, and I'm talking years with families and individuals with developmental disabilities and intensive support needs, as well as firsthand experience with my son, it, it's very clear to all of those who, who have firsthand experiences that the group of individuals with significant support needs, intensive support needs, require much more, the staff requires much more training, coordination, supervision, and an infrastructure that's vastly different from those with less intensive support needs. And very bluntly, the cost uh, is just far different uh, for providers uh, that are trying to serve these individuals. For service providers, I, I serve on the boards for a number of service providers in Maryland, and I can tell you that for those that struggle, that do serve these populations, they have to develop an entire infrastructure to enable them to provide these types of supports. The number of service providers that are willing to take this challenge on has become fewer and fewer over the years, and it's a very significant problem. Any type of sustainable, fair, equitable rate system on a long-term basis really has to address the acuity issue. And it's important to separate. There are many providers where this may not be an issue, where five or 10% of their individuals really require intensive supports. But there are many service providers that face this challenge on a daily basis. And the number of individuals that are able to get services is becoming more and more challenging because it's just not possible for them to do it in the current rate system. Um, the current system, I think, as everybody here probably knows, um, really has two basic levels. And it just does not account for the complex needs of the many individuals 
with intensive needs. Um, this dialogue has been ongoing since prior leaderships for a number of years and just has not been addressed, I think, in a way that, that works for many providers. And I would strongly encourage incorporation of a multi-tier acuity factor option to allow it to be practical for providers to serve these individuals. And just, I'll finish up just, I, I think it's important to involve um, response rates are one thing to a, a complex questionnaire, but getting direct data from those providers uh, that serve this cohort of individuals is particularly important. And I'm not sure that you can equate a response rate or the information you receive in the data form. I think dialoguing very directly and maybe sending your experts to those providers uh, would provide you the data that you need. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to provide the input. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for those uh, for your input. We certainly appreciate it. Close out. All right. So I'm not seeing any other uh, comments from the public. So with that, next slide, please. So um, again, thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to uh, join us today. We know that you are all very busy and you're volunteering your time. Uh, to help with this process. So we certainly do appreciate that. Our next meeting is on May 30th um, of 2024. Um, and to the right, you'll see our DDA's training calendar. So you can click that and not only see and register for uh, future RAG events, but um, other events as well. Next slide, please. Here are the remaining, uh, the dates for the remaining of the cycle. Um, so Wednesday, July 10th, uh, same time, 12.30 to 1.45. Um, we're going to do everything in our power to guarantee an on-start, uh, um, uh, on-time start during those times. And then Thursday, August 22nd, 2024. Next slide. This is just a snapshot of our website where we keep all of the materials, including meeting minutes and recordings to previous meetings and cycles. So um, if you're new to this process or, or just wanna get a refresher, feel free to join us, uh, visit our site. And this is available off of the DDA uh, webpage. Next slide, please. And again, thank you everyone. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you all.